Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode two. If you want to hear about every chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn about money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. It's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school, and accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed material, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and an investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. Today, we have my good friend, David Barnett, on the podcast to share how to increase the value of your business. David's been working with small businesses for over 20 years. He's helped them grow. He's helped entrepreneurs buy and sell them. He's helped people finance them. David is the author of seven books about small business transactions and local investing. He's the host of a YouTube channel with hundreds of videos about buying, selling, financing, and managing SMEs. And he can be found anytime at his blog, David C. Barnett. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, David Barnett. It's great to have you join us today. Hey, Rocky. It's great to be here. So can you share with the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a former business broker, and now I still help people buy and sell businesses, but I have a very different business model. Uh, I basically coach people through the process of buying or selling a business on their own, and I do certain tasks along the way as a consultant that a business broker might do when helping someone buy or sell. Interesting. So you're helping people to make the right decision, but yet you don't have any financials in the specific de de decision. So I guess that takes away all conflicts of interest, correct? Well, it's certainly proven to be one of the advantages when I'm working with buyers because I don't have any sort of financial interest in the ultimate outcome. And and what's interesting, of course, is if you, you know, I always, I always liken it to, uh, you know, if you go to, a car dealership and say you have a transportation problem, it's very unlikely they'll suggest you buy a transit pass. And so <laughs> if you if you go to a business broker and you want help to buy one of the businesses they have for sale, it's un unlikely that they're going to tell you not to buy one. And so a lot of the times when my buying clients come to me, we end up looking under the hood of a particular deal. And I can sometimes come up with reasons why it may not be such a good deal. And of course, you know, that's my job as a consultant coach through that process to help people make the right decision. Likewise, on the other side of the table, people people may not have considered this, but if you're a business owner and you're in a market with a lot of competitive, you know, competing business brokers, for instance, a lot of those brokers are going to try to secure you as a client and get you to sign an exclusive agreement. And one of the ways that they do this is similar to how some real estate agents operate is they may try and show you that they can sell your business for more than anyone else. And so they might actually inflate your expectations in an effort to get you to sign that agreement. And now that your expectations have been set quite high, now they have to try to find a buyer who's going to, to meet those expectations. Whereas when I work with a seller, um, I don't try to push expectations one way or another. I do an evaluation. And I say, this is what your business is likely going to sell for, and here are the likely terms. 
And if someone's not happy with that, they don't have to work with me anymore. But I know that when you go into the market with an overpriced business, the worst thing that can happen is you can spend two years looking for a buyer when the reasonable buyer that had the money, the credit, and the desire to buy your business was scared off by the fact that you telegraphed that you were being unreasonable from the beginning through that high price. And that's not surprising. I know a lot of times, especially on the buy side, they will look at the business and if they don't have good books and it's not clear, people just run because Mm -hmm. it's all a black hole. So if you're talking with a seller and you look at their business, I'm sure that there are things that you can tell them to do to improve their business value. Yeah, and that happens quite often. It really depends upon the motivation of the seller. Um, you know, small and medium sized businesses do not sell for that high, uh, a multiple of cash flow. Most of what people read in the media is about bigger businesses or publicly traded companies, for example, and they sell for, you know, these double digit or, you know, in the case of, of Tesla, you know, the triple digit multiples of their cash flow. And that's just not real in the world of small and medium sized businesses. Um, the riskiness of business dictates that people need a much higher rate of return, which means you know, most of the time when I talk with a seller and I show them what their business is likely going to sell for, the most common response is, well, if I just stayed here for a few years, I'd have that money and still own the business. And those people are correct. So why then do people put these businesses up for sale? <clears throat> it has to do with a pressing personal need. Something changes in their life. This could be, for instance, um, an illness. It could be um, burnout or fatigue. It could be suddenly something happens to make them want to retire. It could be, you know, a divorce. Any one of these kinds of things can cause a business owner to have to put the business up for sale. So by the time I meet them, if they have a pressing personal concern, they may not have time to make adjustments and fix things to make their business more sellable. If they do have time... I almost always am able to give them feedback in doing the evaluation process on what kinds of things could change in order to make the business more valuable. And I think the important thing to realize here is that it's going to take time for the change. Mm. And so that's why I kind of always tell business owners, run your business like you want to sell it, even if you don't, because it does two things. Should you get hit? with a storm, which we don't get to plan these out, you're ready and in the best place. And B, you're much more bankable. You, Mm. you, you, people are more apt to lend you money. So you win, win on the situation of doing things right to begin with. So let's dig into it. I think one of the areas that you had mentioned to me was that we don't manage our taxes well. And the way that we manage our taxes can have a negative impact on business valuations. So what did you mean by that? Well, sure. You know, um, a lot of small business owners uh, will realize that there are certain tax advantages um, to being a small business owner. And, And what they'll realize is that there may be certain things of a personal nature that they might be able to kind of move into their business and, and hope that nobody really looks that carefully. Right. And so I always use the example of, uh, you know, if you think about a business owner, maybe with a teenage child, um, if that business owner takes money out of their business and they pay tax on that money and then they get their their child a cell phone, that cell phone is being paid for with after-tax dollars. Many business owners will realize that it's much cheaper for them just to give their their child a company cell phone, right? And what what they do is they end up uh, taking that expense, they move it into their business, they reduce their business's profit, they reduce the tax burden overall. But when it comes to time to sell that business, they then have to go through a normalization process where they're showing a potential buyer, hey, you know what, the phone expense really isn't this high because my son or daughter has a company cell phone. And you can, I've, I've seen people go through this process where they've they've managed to put tens of thousands of dollars of personal type stuff into their business. And they, they believe that they're being kind of clever and that they're getting away with something. And really they're not following the, the spirit of the tax code. And if they were ever examined closely, they'd probably end up in, in trouble. 
But here's the problem that occurs when you go to sell the business. A buyer might look at all those expenses and agree with you 100% that they are truly not business expenses and that they actually represent profit, okay? But it's not just the buyer that has to be convinced. It's also the buyer's banker if you want to be able to sell the business and have that person qualify for a bank loan. And even if the buyer's banker can be convinced of some of those adjustments, the if you're in the States, for example, um, if you're going to be getting an SBA loan, the SBA administration may not want to look at those adjustments because they want to rely upon the tax returns that were filed with the IRS. So you could be in a situation where you can explain perfectly to a buyer what the true economic output of your business is and why they want to buy it, and then they may not be able to get a loan. And so what we call what I call this is that you've made yourself unbankable. And so the situation that then arises is you're forced to make a decision. You either have to wait until you find a buyer that has significantly more money of their own and their own personal credit facilities, for example, to buy your business, or you're going to have to finance it. And so I've seen many situations where sellers have you know, been forced after meeting several buyers who tried to buy their business and tried to get financing and weren't able to, where these sellers have been forced to accept you know, down payments of 30, 40% of the purchase price with a note saying they're going to get the balance over the course of the next few years. And when most sellers hear that story, it's not very exciting because now you're relying upon the buyer to be a successful operator of your business so that they can make payments to you. You end up being the banker in the deal. And most sellers, of course, would like to walk away from the closing table with far more money. And so this is one of the consequences. You know, I, I, I say to people, hey, you saved your, on your taxes for the last few years by playing this game. This is the ultimate cost of that behavior is you now have this, you know, the penalty of not being able to sell under terms that you find quite so desirable. And what about their current bankers? Will the bankers that they currently work with look at those um, numbers and, and see okay, he really does have more profits or are they also in a situation where they're more hesitant? Well, it's a great question. You know, small business, small businesses in general tend to have a reduced access to institutional capital. So, you know, I, I have actually met very few business owners who have true business credit facilities where they have a, a list of bank covenants, you know, a, a, a banker that makes a business loan to a, to a business, they're going to have rules associated with that. They're going to want to see you have certain balance sheet ratios, certain, um, you know, margins of profit, et cetera. A lot of small business owners have credit facilities that while they're made out to the business are just tied to their own personal credit score. You know, they've got that personal guarantee on them. And so the bankers aren't generally asking for uh, financial statements from the business every year. It's all hinging upon, you know, periodic checks on the on the individual's credit score. If your business is big enough and you're lucky enough to have access to true commercial credit, then you're going to have to make sure that whatever things you're doing, you still fall within those covenants that the banker requires. I've had situations, Rocky, where uh, people have given me, for example, five years of financial statements. And in year four, the profitability fell by 80%. And I'll say to them, what happened in year four? And they'll coyly say to me, well, we paid off the bank. So we didn't have to manage our ratios anymore. And so it was, it was really, they were telling me that because they didn't have to show profit for their banker, they then started to play these types of games even more than before to hide that profitability and try to save on taxes. And it's, it's not a good situation if you're trying to make a deal with a buyer who needs to get a banker on board and who wants to have a high degree of confidence in what you've shown them. You know, that, that seller financing piece I mentioned earlier, um, when I work with buyers, if there's any kind of worry about what's being presented to them, if there's any kind of concern about the financial statements being not exact or or that there's any kind of funny business at all, my go-to you know strategy is to say, look, if there's something wrong with those financial statements, all we have to do 
is have a high degree of seller financing, which is subject to offset in the case of a material misrepresentation. Now we've got a device in place in the deal so that if it turns out after the business has been taken over that things were not presented fairly, that we can then offset our losses or any perceived change in the value of the business against what we owe the seller. So it's it's kind of an after the fact monetary guarantee that the business will be as it's been represented. And, you know, that gives comfort to the buyer. Again, sellers don't like to do that. They want to get the money on closing day. And I don't blame them. And sometimes you need the money and that might be the reason you're closing the business or you don't want the hassles because all of this stuff can come back to bite you and nobody likes stuff that comes back to, to bite us. One of the things that I talk about with Profit First in these situations is when you look at the owner's comp account, and this is where it gets really confusing, that you should put everything that's for the benefit of the owner into the owner's comp account. So if the owner's got a company car, that should go to the owner's comp account. If you have a corporate retreat slash vacation that should go to the owner's comp account. If you're doing the Augusta rule and, and, you know, renting out your house to your company tax-free for 14 days, that should go to the owner's comp account. Your kid's cell phone, owner's comp account, so that you can clearly delineate it. What mm-hmm. are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's a great way to be able to demonstrate to the buyer and convince the buyer that, you know, all of this stuff really is to the owner's benefit. One of the one of the issues that comes up when you're selling a business is that there are certain methods or metrics in the in the business broker community that uh, that are relied upon. One of them is a measure of cash flow called a seller's discretionary earnings. And 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 he, this this is a problem that comes up quite frequently. So the seller's discretionary earnings is the total amount of money available to an owner operator that works full time in the business. And so to calculate this, what a broker will do is they'll take the net income of the business and then they're going to add back certain things to bring it to an EBITDA level. So they're going to add back interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. Okay. And then they're going to add back whatever compensation the owner took out of the business if it if it appears as an expense on the income statement. So th- this doesn't happen in LLCs, but if it's some kind of corporation, you'll see this. And then they'll say, this is the total amount of money available to the owner manager. But you'll notice when I describe that methodology, that two of the things that I added back were depreciation and amortization. And so if we're talking about a corner market, you know, a little convenience store where, you know, the shelving is quite old, but you keep it painted and serviced and it's going to work for a long time and other pieces of capital equipment are long lived and when they have to be replaced, they're not that expensive. This methodology can work okay. But if we're talking about a construction company with heavy equipment, the depreciation, the amortization all of a sudden are a very important part of what it takes to run this business. And so I've seen many a case where a business broker will be presenting a business for sale and claiming a very high level of cash flow, uh, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars of discretionary cash flow. And they take this number and they multiply it by a figure that they found somewhere and they come up with a purchase price. But when I look at the business with a potential buyer, I'll say, not so fast. This business relies upon capital equipment that really does wear out and really does you know fall apart and needs to be replaced we need to make some sort of allowance for that capital expenditure and this comes out of that discretionary cash flow number and so we will see businesses for example rocky that have a high sde number according to the broker but clearly they're in a cash flow situation where they're always behind on on paying things because so much of that quote unquote, discretionary cash flow is going into buying stuff that the business needs. And so if you can show through a a bookkeeping methodology that, yeah, this is the money that really does come out. And this other money is the money that's being reinvested in stuff the business needs. It makes it much easier for you to demonstrate the true free cash flow to the owner, which is ultimately what the buyer is buying when they acquire a business. They're acquiring a cash flow. 
interesting. And there's so many different ways to look at things that you really have to take multiple points of view and get a clear picture. And I think that's Mm -hmm. not always easy to do. And I know when you look at the accounting and you look at the reports that come out of it, it is so easy to hide things. It's beyond comprehension. And it's not that people do it on purpose. Sometimes it's just done on mistake and nobody's actually digging through to even check and see if things are appropriately done. I know for me, that's a big part of what I do is monthly. I'm constantly going into people's books and going, how come this is here? And there's a lot of miscategorized things because Mm -hmm. somebody did something. And if you're just looking at the top line, you're going to miss all of that in the bottom line. You won't see it and you don't have a clear picture. Well, and and the the depreciation thing is is something that people need to be aware of when they're looking at any kind of business that has a lot of equipment or machinery because in big publicly traded companies, they've got some sort of depreciation policy in place, straight line, declining balance depending on the category of asset. And in a big enough company, that depreciation number probably approximates the real expense of replacing the fleet of equipment. You know, you replace certain things every year. On average, it kind of works out. But when you're looking at small businesses that might buy a major piece every couple of years, and then you pair that with some of the things, for example, uh, in the Trump tax changes, they did more uh, accelerated depreciation um, allowances for different things. You can get things where the depreciation people are doing on their on their tax returns are in no way, um, you know, uh, mirroring the reality of what's happening in the business's fleet of equipment. And so you really need to take a close look at that. I've seen this time and again for businesses like landscaping companies, different construction companies, foundation companies, et cetera. You really have to have an idea of what's going on with the equipment and if a deal is going to happen, some sort of analysis or or look from someone who's technically knowledgeable in that field needs to be done to really see what the upcoming requirements are going to be. You have to factor that into the cash flow. So when I work with clients who have high capital requirements like that, we, we will actually set up an extra account Mm-hmm. to set money aside so that they have the money to buy the equipment over time because people they take the depreciation but when you're taking the depreciation you really should be setting that money aside to buy the new equipment if you're in the type of business that needs to constantly be replacing equipment and being able to do that and i'm always surprised like everyone thinks accelerated depreciation is somehow some bonus but literally all you're doing is moving your your taxes that you would have gotten next year the the deduction to this year you're really not saving on taxes over the length of the equipment you're just changing when you get the tax breaks Mm -hmm. and up until now it's all been wonderful but we just have a change in our American politics, and I don't think our new president wants to lower business taxes. So if you're accelerating your depreciation, this year you're going to get a smaller deduction than if you pay if you do it next year if tax rates go up. So next year it would be more valuable. So all these people looking to rush everything are actually hurting themselves over the long term. Oh, that's a great point. You know, um, whenever uh, we're looking at a business that has this kind of scenario, um, what what I will often do as a crutch is I will use uh, the, the if you do a Google search, you'll find various uh, equipment lease payment calculators. Um, because if you lease a piece of equipment on a capital lease versus buying it, um, basically what's happening is the the leasing company they're enjoying all the depreciation aspects uh, because they're depreciating the asset on their books. And you're just paying that lease payment every month to use the equipment. And maybe there's a buyout at the end. But that monthly figure, I'll use that in, in, in looking at the cash flow. I'll just say, well, if we had to replace all these pieces of equipment and we were leasing them, what would the cash flow be then? 
And that's the number that I'll be focused on with my client. You know, here's really a good representation of what's really truly available. Because if you were paying for that equipment over the course of time as it wore out, like you would be in a lease arrangement, this is what you would really have left over at the end of the day. And that's essentially what our capital account does, because it's mm -hmm. forcing you to take a percentage of all your sales and put it aside for future investment in whatever machinery or whatever it is that you're doing. And it essentially does that so that you don't spend your new equipment today thinking you have lots of extra money when in reality you don't. And so that really helps to smooth it out year to year and over time. And it gives you a stronger financial foundation. Yeah, I can certainly see the benefit of doing that. David, in looking at all of these companies on both sides, I've got to believe you've seen a lot of messes out there. What are some of the things that you've seen that we could teach lessons to help others not make those mistakes? Oh, yeah. So one, one of the most common things I see, Rocky, is that people will bring their homeowner mentality into their business. And, and here's what I mean. Um, they will do things like buy a piece of real estate for their business because they believe that owning is better than renting. Um, and they will do things like um, make investments in their business that will increase their net income, but they never look at it from the point of view of return on equity. I always point out that the very smart people who run very large businesses are actually not trying to increase their net income. They try to increase their return on equity. This is why companies like Walmart rarely own their own stores. They lease them. Because if, if Walmart put a down payment on a piece of commercial property, that money they invest there might appreciate a couple percentage points a year. But if they invest that money in inventory, they can turn it over every 30 days with maybe a 30% markup, right? And so it's a better way to apply their own capital to invest in inventory rather than investing in real estate. And so they lease. And so I've run into many instances where people will invest in something in their business. For example, they'll use their own money to finance accounts receivable. And what that does is it means they've got more of their own money tied up in their business. If people, buyers demand a 30 or 40% rate of return on their business and they're tying up their own money in order to save, you know, paying a bank five or 6% on a revolving credit line for financing receivables. Then what they're doing is they are earning a far lower rate of return on their own money than what a buyer deems the risk requires of their business. And so this is one of the reasons why I will say to many business owners, it pays to have your business valued every once in a while, to have an idea of where you're at and how buyers are going to see your business. I'll give you an example of a recent client that I had, and I did a business valuation for them, and the number was, was much lower than they thought it should have been. And then one of them had a question. It was a, a group of people. One of them had a question. They said, well, what was our business worth in 2015? And so I went into my model and I reweighted the average years and I basically put all the weighting on that 2015 year and it came back and the number was almost the same. The business had grown in five years. The business was making more money in five years. So how come it was worth the same? Well, the operating capital, capital tied up to make the business work had more than doubled in the same period of time. So they were using more and more money in a less and less efficient way. Their inventories had grown, their, their receivables had grown, advances they make to certain suppliers had grown. So they, their efficiency at making money with their own, at making profit with their own money was declining. <clears throat> their entire focus was always on net income. And so they were taking all of their earnings almost every year and redeploying it within the business what they were doing was creating an increasingly less efficient money machine. And so when I pointed these different things out to them, I said, look, if you could get back to the level of efficiency you had in 2015, you could take 
several hundred thousand dollars out of this business and still make the same money you're making. But they never once were focused on their capital allocations. They never planned how much money they wanted to have invested in inventory or in financing receivables. They just kept managing the business, looking for opportunities. And if they thought they, they could make money with a new product or whatever, they just pursued it. They never sat down to look at their balance sheet the way the guys over at Walmart do every day. Interesting. That's getting into some advanced calculations <laughs> and advanced types of things. I like. I have a philosophy of, because this is a constant argument, and my philosophy is remove profit from your business and go invest mm -hmm. it somewhere else. Don't just necessarily reinvest all your profit in your business. And it sounds along the same lines as what you're saying. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. It is. And and so, you know, I think that you're, you're a person who says that uh, you want to be resourceful. Right. And so if these people had had that discipline in their business, if they were removing that profit every year, they would then be left trying to figure out how to add those new product lines without increasing inventory investment. Right. And it probably would have led them to more creative solutions. And if they were making more sales and more profit without increasing their operating capital, well, then they would have they, their business would become more profitable and more efficient the return on equity would also be increasing. And, and as an owner of a small business, the part that you own, the equity, the difference between the assets and the liabilities, that's your investment. And you want to have a, as high a rate of return as you can because business is risky. And if you're in a situation where a banker will lend you money at a very low interest rate, for example, to finance receivables to your customers, why would you do that with your own money? in a business that's risky, why not take that money out and go buy some other non-correlated asset, like an apartment building or something, right? And start diversifying your personal net worth portfolio and not have everything tied up in the business. Because as we know, business is risky. And if we look at business success statistics, we know that, you know, businesses don't last forever. Something changes. And you want to be able to have something that's no longer on the table if something starts to fail in the business. Or you get blindsided by something like COVID. <laughs> As they say, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. David, if people would like to learn more about you, connect with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Sure. Um, my blog site is over at davidcbarnett.com. And if you head over there, you can find an email list sign-up form. And every week I put out a new video, which are largely based on questions that people submit to me about buying and selling businesses. And so if you look on YouTube as well, just search David Barnett, you're bound to find me. Uh, I've got hundreds of videos up there all about buying, selling, fin financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. Thank you so much for joining us today. I will put those links in the show notes to make it easy for people who would like to connect with you. Thanks, Rocky. It's been a pleasure. There are a lot of things you need to think through as you decide what's most important for you to focus on in your business. I recommend creating thinking time where you think about your business instead of dealing with every single fire that comes along. David gave us a lot to think about today. Remember, you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful. We focus on the bottom line. This is why we're talking about removing money from the business to force you to not be lazy, but to be more resourceful. Profit First does this for you. It's designed to help you overcome your bad habits. If you want a done-for-you service, you can have me as your chief profitability officer because you have your zone of genius and want to spend time doing what you love. I only work with a handful of clients so they can get my full attention. I work with business owners who are growing to half a million to five million in revenue. There's a scheduling link in the show notes to get on my calendar and schedule a good fit call to see if we are a good fit 
and I can support you. If you want to learn about living the life of your dreams, check out my other podcast, Richer Soul. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.